coming. Um, and I just thank uh, Brother Carter Q for letting me go. Uh, before I begin, I always like to begin things in the name of the Most High, uh, because without the Most High, none of this is possible. Uh, I want to give honor to our ancestors and give honor to all those who did their part in the thing for humanity. I would like to, um, before we begin with the slide presentation, this is the possible presentation, just touch on a few things um, to elaborate. This particular subject uh, was the product of a conversation with me and Brother Carter Q, and I really can't thank him enough. Because in, discussion, in the discussion, we came across the reality that there are certain things that are not being taught um, in general, in society, but in particular, in our schools. And we know that this is important because our children are our future. Uh, as we know we're in the month of February, they call this Black History Month. And in, in light of that, we really need to know what it is is being taught, what is, what is not being taught, and what should be taught. What I'm going to explore here is really North Carolina history. It's a history that's not being told for the most part. Uh, you have to do quite a bit of research. And it is my hope that uh, each and every one of you are able to get something out of it. And, and again, I do thank each and every one of you for coming, because you could have been anywhere else but you chose to be here. So with that, I'd like to begin with the slide presentation. Carolina in color, the untold history of the indigenous people, true indigenous people in Carolina. Now, when we talk about indigenous people, the common term that is used in society is Indian. Now, if I was just to ask the question, um, or just say Indian, the image will pop in your mind automatically. Most of these images are derived from media. So I wanted to touch on that first before we get into the actual definition of what an Indian or an indigenous person is, a true American, Native American. This is an image that a lot of us for those who, I ain't, don't give your age up, but <laughs> um, was seen on TV. This is a show called Lone Ranger, right? And of course you see the masked man, the cowboy, supposedly, and you see this uh, image of a person who they call an Indian. Now this is Tonto. Now, the point I want to make here is that this is the most common phenotype image that is promoted through the media. If you notice, he looks kind of like a, and I say this with no disrespect, kind of like a, a person who's from Mexico or Latin American. Um, has a tan, but not too dark, not pale, straight hair, and you can see the features. So there are many images like this throughout uh, media history. And you can go to the next slide. Now this is uh, Indian Cody, right? Have anybody ever seen this commercial? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It talks about um, pollutant. There's a, uh, there's a trash in and he drops a tear, <laughs> one single tear. <laughs> He's crying for the earth. Get involved now. Pollution hurts all of us. Now, the interesting thing about Indian Cody, as he was called, is that uh, he wasn't an Indian. He was an Italian. Um, and this was actually exposed by his sister. He ended up denying it, but um, his name was, I believe, was Corti. The Italian name, C O R T I. And then when he got into Hollywood, they kept um, stereocasting him in Indian roles. 
and then he became Cody, Indian Cody. But that's just to let you know. Now, this is an interesting thing. I, I remember the um, joke by Chris Rock where he said, you don't see any real Indians anymore. You go to the uh, Thanksgiving parade, you'll see one Indian and uh, a bunch of uh, Puerto Ricans dressed up <laughs> like Indians. But, but it, it brings a point. The point being that they want us to think that the indigenous people on this country looked a certain way and that they can't look any other way but that. So this is just one of the images of many. So now that we, we explore some of the images, a couple of the images, let's go and see exactly the true definition of an indigenous person, a Native American. This is from Webster's Dictionary in 1828. 1828 definition of America. And if you notice just by those pictures, no Native American tribe looked exactly the same. You had some with straight hair, some with woolly hair, some with curly hair. But below is the actual definition, verbatim. American, noun. A Native of America originally applied to the aboriginals or copper colored races found here by the Europeans, but now applied to the descendants of Europeans born in America. This is from 1828, Webster's Dictionary. You can find yourself. Now there'll be um, times where I will um, pause just so that people can get, um, get a good look of the slides that are being um, presented. But this is something that is not being taught in our schools. So, copper colored races. Now, anybody here got a penny in them? Now, we all ballers, we got hundred dollar bills. <laughs> but if you look at a, at a penny, that's what a penny looks like. And you see two different images. So when it said copper colored races, who were they talking about? What is the complexion? What is the phenotype of the indigenous American? And we know all Native, all Native American tribes did not look the same. And there was variations of tones. But why is this not being explored, especially when when they did the last um, Long Ranger movie, who played Tonto? Anybody know? Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp. He's not Tonto. Huh? I'm not saying he doesn't have a Native American him. I'm just saying. He had a pain on his face the whole time. We have to address these things. We have to get to the truth of what it is because it's not about one race being superior over another, it's about the truth. When you know the truth about America and people, then we don't have the hatred. So that's what this is about. This is a good book I would encourage everybody to get, um, dealing with the pre-Columbian era of the Americas. This is called The African Presence in ancient America. They came before Columbus by the late great professor Ivan Van Sertima. One of the things he spoke about, and you see that, that image right there, or that stone, uh, that is known as an Olmec head. They were found in Mexico. Big, big stone heads, weighing tons found underneath the earth. And if you look at the phenotype of those indigenous people in Mexico who were known as the Olmecs, um, coming from a word meaning rubber, the rubber people, there's actually a, a, another indigenous term for them called the, the Z, XI people. But 
you can't, you may not be able to really see it too closely, but on the other end, they show a picture on the other side of a, of what they would call an African of the, I think the Nuba tribe. You see they have the exact same phenotype. Exact same. So, what does that tell you? And this is before they say Columbus discovered America, but let me say this right now. If you believe that Columbus discovered America, um, I got a couple of bridges around the corner <laughs> that I can sell you because you can't discover a place that's already inhabited. That's like me coming in your house, putting up a flag, and said, I discovered your home. It can't happen. So these are the things we have to talk about. So that's a good book to get. Next slide. This is a statue of a man called Estan, Estevanico, sometimes Estevanico. I, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Estevanico the Moor, lived from 1500 to 1533. By raise of hands, how many people have heard of this man? A couple. Wow, this is a teaching moment. This man here, is known as the first quote unquote non-native to explore um, certain parts of the Americas. And I'm just reading this right here. The life of Estebanico is one of the most fascinating stories in American history. He was the first non-native person to visit the areas of Arizona and New Mexico. They say that this man, he was born in Morocco and he was captured, put into bondage. But what was unique was that because of his extraordinary knowledge, um, him being a polygriot, um, knowing different languages, he wasn't treated like the average slave, and he had the ability to navigate. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the next slide and show his actual travels. This is actually a map showing where he traveled. Now you see, notice that green arrow, that's his journey from Morocco. So you see where he hits the island, Hispaniola, goes up to Florida, all along the coast. Louisiana, Texas, down there gets into Mexico, and then travels back up. He was in search for um, a particular city. Um, he ended up being killed by the Zuni tribe. But the reason why I put this up is because during the 1500s, keep in mind, they say that the slave trade made certain people um, ineligible or incapable of doing certain feats. And I'm going to get into this term the more, um, more into that term later. Because the Moors were a group of people not only known from Morocco, but you'll see later on there's groups of people that identified as Moors here in America. So I just wanted to touch on that point. If we can get to the um, next slide. Here. This is a map, or I should say this picture is taken from a book written by a man named um, Arnoldus Matanis. And you see where it says America. Now, this particular picture was drawn by a man named Jacob Van Moors. And the book was translated and published in England. It's actually a Dutch book. And the man who wrote it is um, Dutch. It was republished under the title of America, being an accurate description of the New World. America being an accurate description of the new world. Now, 
I want you to see something. Do you notice that little ship, a little thingy where that Native American is standing on top of? Let me, let me expound on this. This right here. And that headdress. These are the Native Americans. Different shades. But you can see, they don't look like Tonto. This is actually a woman right here. Being held up in a hole. Now, the reason why it says Stock Moors, City of the Moors in 1671, this is what it says in the bottom. In the end, this is in Dutch, by the way. Stock, this Stock Moors. M E U R S. That is a Dutch, Dutch language for the word Moors. Stopped is Dutch and also is a German word if you look it up, meaning city. There was a city that the Dutch were saying was a city of Moors. This is in 1671. I didn't draw this. Nobody I knew drew this. This is ancient. Not ancient, but it's old. And um, I'll speak on that a little later. But I want to just let you see exactly that at a certain point in time, there were people. What I'm doing is give you a broad picture on the ancient Americas, and then I'm going to focus on the Carolinas. I'm trying to give you a chronological view on what we're speaking about. Next slide. Mori Tiapolis. Mori, also Mori Tiapolis. As in Minneapolis, Indianapolis, Metropolis, whenever you see that suffix, that's a word for city. This is actually a name of a place. You can look it up in an old map that was part of Brazil. This is, uh, when they did maps back then, they were very elaborate. Uh, they did a lot of illustrations. And you see in that corner, that lower, which you can't read it, but that lower uh, left-hand corner, it gives you a marker of different places of that city. So they, they did maps and books that way. And that was the name of a place in Brazil during that time. So we're covering the Americas. We're covering North, Central, and South America based on images that were put together by different explorers, whether they be Dutch, Portuguese, um, Spanish, etc. To give you a, a timeline on what actually happened in 1828 definition of America applies and how it changed. Africans and the Native Americans. This is also another great book um, written by Jack D. Forbes. Uh, African and Native Americans, the language of race and the evolution of red black peoples. <clears throat> that picture right there is also um, a picture of three Native Americans down there in, um, I believe, Ecuador, if I'm not mistaken. But, no, let me, let me track that. Those are early Americans who, who actually migrated from, from Africa, but they became part of the early Americans during that time. They did, they did travel, those particular ones. Let me go to the next slide. Melungeons. This is another book. Who here has heard of the Melungeons? All right, so a little more hands. That's good. Okay, the Melungeons. This is a book by N. Brent Kennedy. It says, The Resurrection of a Proud People, an untold story of ethnic cleansing in America. Now, interesting thing about Melungeons for those who don't know, 
is that the Melungeons are a group of people, um, part of what they call the uh, tri-racial groups within the Carolinas. I'm going to show you later on um, there were different tri-racial groups throughout the East Coast, uh, particularly you're dealing with North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, parts of Tennessee as well, and the Melungeons were one of them. They actually claim Moorish ancestry, and I'm going to give you a background story. <clears throat> During the, um, the time of Sir Francis Drake, who here has heard of Sir Francis Drake? Right? A lot of people. Okay. Okay. How many people knew about the time, well, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to ask. It was a time when he came through, um, and we're talking about the areas of, uh, in the Carolinas, where he had with him on a ship almost over 200 Moors. And sometimes they'll say, use the term Moriscos, sometimes they'll use the term Muslim. But there was over 200 with him um, that he brought with him to the Americas on his ships. And there came a time when the British uh, no, long, no longer wanted to be in America. They had with them the Moors and they had with them the Turks. And they wanted to leave and go back to Europe. When they left to go back to Europe, they left. The Moors. <clears throat> the Moors is pretty much um, left to fend for themselves and make it the way they could. And they ended up um, basically amalgamating and settling in with um, the various natives on the land at that time. Um, they say Melungeons. Uh, comes from a Portuguese word, and a lot of them will use the term that they're Portuguese. There's records that talk about the Melungeons referring to themselves as Portuguese. Another word that they'll use is Geechee. Mm -hmm. Y'all heard of that? Yeah. Um, I remember a long time ago, um, my grandmother who passed away, um, she is actually from South Carolina. She lived here in North Carolina, in Greene County. But I found out that she had Native American roots in South Carolina. And I was curious, like, you know, what, um, what, what, what Indian girl was from? I heard Geechee. Geechee? I didn't know Geechee. I heard a Cherokee. I heard a Blackfoot. So, you know, Iroquois and Geechee. But then later on, I found out um, about that. Um, there also are some records where at one time the Melungeons, who referred to themselves as Portuguese, there are records where certain Europeans who found a certain disdain for them referred to them as Portuguese niggers. And the thing is, is that the Melungeons never identified themselves as either white, nor did they identify themselves as Negro at that time. That, that was a term that was used at that time. They didn't identify themselves as that. They kept a unique, um, a unique identity in the Carolinas. And they pretty much kept it themselves. So I want to show an actual excerpt of that book. This is page 119 of the Melungeons, the book, and you see where it says here, I'll read it. Consisting primarily of Collinses, Gibsons, and Mullinses, and those are last names, because uh, many of these Melungeons, um, a lot of you, if you trace back through your surname, your family name, and you from here in the Carolinas, you'll find that you'll have some linkage to certain 
um, Native American indigenous peoples. Consisting primarily of Collinses, Gibsons, and Mullinses, were undoubtedly members of the Poetan, Pamunkey, Moorish population of Central Virginia. So these people with these last names were connected to um, that population, that ancestry from Central Virginia. And keep in mind, the Mullinges extended from there to Tennessee, all the way into Carolina. Now this is an 1898 um, article. Actually, it's a letter to the editor in the Atlanta Constitution, to be more correct. And I'm just going to read certain parts of this. Okay, in the beginning, it says, near a month ago, well, first it says, Meridian, Mississippi, March 11th, under this Constitution. Near a month ago, an article appeared in the Constitution named Melungeons. I laid it aside in order to correspond with the writer, but the paper got destroyed, and the name and address had not been noticed with care and or forgotten. He goes on to say, his name, Melungeons, is a local designation for this small, peculiar race. Their own claim to be Portuguese is more generally known. Their original site is on the Petey River in South and North Carolina. They were once especially strong in Georgetown and Darlington districts of the lab. Though called Portuguese, this does not indicate their true origin. And I'll go a little further. And then it speaks about what we were just talking about. He goes on to go into the origin. He says, and, and later down he says, the crew consisting mostly of Moors with a sprinkling of Arabs and Negroes were turned ashore free. Their complexion and religion prevented immediate absorption by the right, white race, and they found wives among Indians, Negroes, and cast off white women at a time when many of these last were sold by immigrant ships for their passage money. They became a peculiar people. They were the free people of color of the PD region so true to Marion during our revolutionary struggle, and no other race in America retained such traditionary hatred of the British. You remember the story I just told you about the British dropping them off? It goes on to end, towards the end of this letter, he says, uh, in part, if he can find a few pure specimens their physical structure, their hair, their teeth, and general features, though every trace of their Muslim religion and North African dialect may have been long lost. This is an actual article, 1890, 1889, that was put back then. So this is uh, nothing I'm making. So it tells you about the Melungeons and evidence of where they link themselves to. Let me go to the next one. This is an actual map. This map here is actually taken from Edward T. Price's 1953 article entitled A Geographic Analysis of White Negro Indian Racial Mixtures in the Eastern United States. So here, you see in the Carolinas, you see the Melungeons, right there. Um, but for who, those who can't really see it, just, y'all can't, can y'all see this? No. No? You can see it, but not read it. Not, not read it? Okay, well let me, let me guide through. This says Melungeons, um, um, Croatans, or sometimes called Croatoans, we're gonna get to that. Cubans, 
up here in the Delaware, the Moors, and there's actually a group called the Delaware Moors. So you see up in certain parts of uh, these particular, of the eastern coast, red bones in Louisiana. I'm gonna get, there's an interesting story about red bones. Who, um, anyone here is from Louisiana or ever been to Louisiana? Okay, all right. I, I lived in Louisiana for a short time, and um, this became real popular hearing about a red bone. I, I was single at the time. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, some partners say, say, well, even, you need to get you a red bone. You know, find red bone. And I never, I was like, I'm from New York. I, that don't mean nothing to me. I never heard that. But uh, they were using it to imply a light complexion uh, woman. Um, some people would say high level, but red bone, that is actually uh, a term used for a group of people we call now Indians. Let's go to the next slide. This is an 1897 letter from James Mooney. James Mooney was an um, ethnologist from the Smithsonian Institute of the Borough of American Ethnology. And he sent this letter to Charles Furman. And they're discussing about red bones. So I'm going to actually read, because I know y'all can't read that script. So I'm going to read the letter for you. It says, Dear Mr. Furman, your letter with red bone clipping came while I was away in Nashville setting up an Indian exhibit at the exposition. I was glad to get both. Croatans, Red Bones, Melungeons, Moors, Portuguese are local names for a mixed Indian race along the South Atlantic seaboard with westward drive into the mountains. It would be worth the while of local investigators to go into the subject systematically. A good deal is probably in old colonial state county records. I think possibly the Indian remnant may have married with the convict and apprentice importation of early colony days, as well as with the free Negro element. Wouldn't it be possible yet Recover, a, to recover a Catawba, uh, I may be mispronouncing yeah, that's, that's it, that's it. That's that's it. it. Catawba <laughs> geography with old town rights and Catawba local names and etymologies. My ghost dance is out in the 14th Amend Report, which you will doubtless receive soon. Yours, James Moon. He's stating in this letter that the term Croatans, Red Bones, Melungeons, Moors, Portuguese are all just different names for a race of mixed indigenous people. Mixed blood indigenous people. This is what he said. He's an eth ethnologist. And this is in 1897. So, that statement that some people like to say, I got Indian in my family. <laughs> this is where a lot of this comes from. Because the reality of it is, is that a lot of us either are totally that, um, connected with the indigenous people or have some link to the indigenous people. And they were mixing in back then. They didn't deal with the segregation issue that was imposed later on. So because of that, you have all these different names. And there's always an argument as to who's a true quote unquote Indian, when in reality, dealing with ethnology, it goes deeper than what people like Think it's not just the texture of your hair, etc. First page of since I mentioned about the Smithsonian Institute 
of the Borough of America in tech, uh, Ethnology. This is their handbook. This is called the Handbook of American Indians, North of Mexico. This is something that they published and put out um, by the Washington Government Printing Office. This is actually dated in 1907. I'm putting this out in connection with the letter because I want you to see something. This is their book. This is a government documented book put out by their institution, I should say, rather. So they have a glossary of terms. And all these terms are supposed to um, be affiliated with the American Indians north of Mexico. So let's explore that and see the next slide. This is on page 940. Moors defined. You see it? Moors. For those who can't see, Moors. And it says, see um, Croatan Indians. Now, why do I make that a point? And the reason why I make that a point so much is because you keep hearing me. Why I keep saying Moors, Moors? The reason is, is because I know most people, who haven't heard of the Moors? Everybody heard of the Moors. When I heard of the Moors, the first time I heard about the Moors was through Othello. Everybody knows about Othello. Okay. Who was a fictitious character. And I've seen certain images of um, James Earl Jones, Lawrence Fishburne, other different um, actors who are classified as black actors, playing the role of Othello, a Moor. Then I saw the movie Black Knight with um, Martin Lawrence. And you see where he's going into time, and they call him Moor, and he's like, uh, he's catching a fence, don't call me no more. You mean Moor. He doesn't realize that the term Moor was a title of nobility. And then I saw Robin Hood, Wazim the Moor, Morgan Freeman, et cetera, et cetera. As I went and studied about the Moors, for the most part, all I heard was about Moors in North Africa. And in 1711, they go into Spain, conquer Spain, rule it for over 800 years. Empire falls, then you don't hear about them. For a long time, that's what, that's what I was told. It was only identified in certain history books to a people in North Africa, Northwest Africa. But here, in their book, 1904, they have a definition of a group of people called Moors connected to Croatan Indians. Now, if we go to the next slide, we see the definition of Croatan Indians. The Croatans were called Moors, and I know Everybody can't see that. So, what I like to do is read, because I can kind of read it. It says the legal um, designation in North Carolina for a people evidently of mixed Indian and white blood, found in various east, eastern sections of the state, but chiefly in Robeson County. Got any people from Robeson? No, the right up in Wilson County? Oh, okay. And, and many, in numbering approximately 5,000. Now, I'm going to go down to the, to the other paragraph. It says, across the line in South Carolina are found a people evidently of similar origin designated red bones in portions of West North Carolina and East Tennessee are found the so-called Melungeons probably from French meaning mixed, or Portuguese, apparently an offshoot of the Croatan people. And in Delaware are found the Moors. All of these are local designations for people of mixed race with an Indian nameless differing in no way from the present mixed blood remnants known as a monkey, Chickahominy, 
and um, Nipomon Indians in Virginia. And it goes on. So my point of this is that it shows in that particular record, it is directly relating Croatan Indians with um, the Moors, directly. And for those who don't know, some, some of you do know, is that when you research Croatan, you'll find that that is also another term. Another term for Croatan is Lumbi. Mm -hmm. When you hear the words Croatan or Croatoan, uh, Lumbi, and uh, Robeson County. in Robeson County, Lumberton County, Lumberton County, Lumberton County, and uh, I believe Chickasaw, and, and, yeah, Pimbrook. 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 Chickasaw. Mm -hmm. These are synonymous for for the same people. So just keep that in mind. The next one. This is a picture of an actual Croatan from Sampson County. That don't look like Tom Tanks. <laughs> that don't look like any related. Jonathan Goodman. And, I, and I'll be honest, when I first saw this, I thought about people in my family. My family is from Greene County. And um, I actually have an aunt from my, side of the, my father's side of the family who lives in um, Cleveland. She is 108. Um, she turned 108 in January. But the thing is that when I would see a lot of pictures from, the, from my grandfather, great-grandfather, they had that type of look. Honestly, they had that type of look. Very dark skin, broad nose, high cheekbones, and um, their hair was woolly, but it wasn't all the way woolly. And you can see that. Very dark complexion, copper tone, croatan. Next one. Benjamin Harris. He is actually, uh, or oh, he was actually, a chief of Catawba people. Don't look like Thompson. Don't look like Kobe. He looked like a brother from. Uh, McDougal. <laughs> I might run up into uh, down Fayetteville. <laughs> and if you notice that headdress, you remember the picture that I showed, uh, the map, the American? Yeah. It's no, that's the same actual headdress. Exact same. And these are people here in the Carolinas. That's an old picture. This is a group of Melungeon and dark skin. Again, we all didn't look the same. You have straight hair there. And notice, I, I want you to notice, look at that baby right there that is being held. Look at that broad nose and thick lips and fat cheeks. <laughs> and uh, I make it a point to talk about um, a broad nose. Now you see some of, the, some of their nose is not as broad, but some of them do have broad noses. And I make that a point because um, I've had conversations with people who would argue <coughs> with me and said that certain people can't be Native American because their nose is broad. You got an African nose. <laughs> well, look at that nose. That's Melange nose. Okay. Next picture. This is also a Melungeon family from the Appalachians. I wanted to show the contrast because the first family had straight hair. But you can see them boys, they got they got nappy, they got peasy hair. <laughs> you, ever, you ever grew up, for those who know, yeah. Yeah. hands on that, you gotta wet your hair comb. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, shot. But that is actually another Melungeon family. So when you deal with Melungeons who call themselves Gichi or the Portuguese, there was a variety of, of um, hair textures, as well as a variety of other skin types, but certain things they did share in the dark complexion. So, 
Next slide. Ayas, we went into the laundry, we got now going to the Cherokee. That is a Cherokee woman, she is a storyteller. Um, remember I mentioned about the letter from um, James Mooney? Well, James Mooney was in the Carolinas, and he did a study, and that, that's why I said from 1887 to 1890, giving the history of the Cherokee. Now, I'll be honest, she looked like somebody in my family. Here's an interesting thing. I want to uh, just read this real quick. Ayasta, one of three Cherokee storytellers interviewed extensively by James Mooney between 1887 and 1890. She was the only woman privileged to speak in council among the East Cherokee. The East Cherokee people are a federally recognized Indian tribe to this day. Um, but a lot of people don't know, you know, about her. She kept the records of the Cherokee people. It was because of her that certain um, researchers was able to get the history on the Cherokee people. And she's, most people don't know her. But she's from Carolina. Carolina history. You go to the next one. Um, Ramona Moore of the Tuscarora people. She's living today. She is also a storyteller and a historian. She currently lives in um, Charlotte. I actually tried to reach out to her and communicate with her. Um, I, I tried to invite her. Well, I did invite her to come to this. Um, but she was unable to. Her name um, or her, they, she goes by Ramona Big Eagle. Now, again, she doesn't look like your quote unquote stereotypical Indian. <coughs> Broad nose. You follow? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a black and white picture. There's a, there's a, um, you, you can go online and actually Google her, Ramona Moore. Um, she's, she's still doing work today for the Tuscarora people. She lives in Charlotte. And notice her last name is Moore. Moore with an E at the end. And um, it does have relevance. And the reason why it does have relevance is because in Old English, in certain writings, more was spelled with an E on the end. And we also have <coughs> Moore County. What's the next one? Moore County, North Carolina. Excuse me. Now, the interesting thing about Moore County is a couple of things. When I looked up the history of Moore County, they tried to say that Moore County was named after a, a um, I want to say a high-ranking official in the, in the Civil War who fought for the Confederacy. The only thing about that is he never lived in Moore County. <laughs> never lived there. Wasn't born there, didn't live there, didn't die. So I was like, why, why, would, why would this county name it after a person who had no connection to that part? of North Carolina. The other thing that I found interesting is that if you see the head township in the middle, those who can't see it, so this is called Carthage. Now, why would they name that Carthage? And that, that term directly relates to the history of the Moors. Also, another interesting when I saw this, this one right here, Ben Selim. Ben Selim actually is composed of two words um, in ancient Semitic language of Arabic. Ben and Salam. Ben meaning sun, and Salam meaning peace. That's actually what it means. Ben Salam. Ben Salem, son of peace. 
But of course, they want us to think that this has nothing to do with the morals of history. It was named after somebody who did it. But I just wanted to show that. More camera, more camera. Charlotte, Queen Charlotte of Mecklenburg. You all know about Charlotte, North Carolina, right? I know a lot of us are going to be watching the Super Bowl tomorrow. We can go to Panthers, I am too. I'll bring it back home. But uh, this is actually a portrait of Queen Charlotte, 1761. Now, there's a lot of controversy about Queen Charlotte from where you get the name Charlotte, North Carolina, and Mecklenburg County. But if you Google Queen Charlotte of Mecklenburg Sterlitz, you'll quickly come across a historian called Mario de Valdez de Cocon. Now, this historian argues that her features that you see right there, as seen in royal portraits, were conspicuously, in his terms, conspicuously Moorish, and contends that they were noted by numerous contemporaries. He also claims that the queen, though German, was directly descended from a Moorish branch of Portuguese royal family related to Margarita de Castro e Souza a 15th century Portuguese noblewoman, nine generations removed, whose ancestry she traces to the 13th century ruler, Alfonso III, and his lover, Madragana, whom Valdez takes to have been a Moor. Now, but Madra, uh, Madragana, spelled M-A-D-R-A-G-A, in A, if you look that up, uh, you'll find exactly what he's talking about. Because there was all there was always um, amongst historians that 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 particular woman was undoubtedly a Moor. So, and as you see, she herself has mixed features or features of a um, person of, of mixed blood. Right, you can see the um, what people would say Africoid features, um, and you see the light skin, the um, the curly hair, not quite not quite straight, not quite woolly, in between. This is who Charlotte is named after. Her, Lumbee people. This is actual photograph of um, four Lumbee students of. <coughs> Uh, if I'm not mistaken, UNC. Thank you. So you see this. This is actual um, people. Remember, we said the Lumbee people is another name for the Croatan people, right? Dark skin. Again, some of them had straight hair. Some of them had. Curly hair, some that had real coarse hair. But you can definitely see that these were dark, melanized, melanated, melanized people. Again, not your stereotypical image of what they call an Indian. Battle of Hayes Palm. How many people are familiar with that? I see there's a few. There's a few. I'm going to give you some. Um, Insight for all those who are not familiar with that. Battle of Hayes Pond in 1958 um, took place in, I believe, the town of Maxton, um, North Carolina, Robeson County. This was known as the clash of the, of the Lumpy War. What ended up taking place was the Ku Klux Klan wanted to do a rally, but they actually attempted to do a rally. Um, in this particular area, which is, uh, which was, of course, uh, where the Lumbee people resided. The Lumbees were not having it. 
See my man here with the, he got the long shotgun. <laughs> ready for war. You know what I'm saying? They, they came in, got their leather coat. They're not, and again, they look like, you know, these are Nate, Lumbee people, Native Americans. They look like the average everyday people. They didn't come, you know, and, they, and I don't say this with disrespect. They didn't come, you know, with no feathers on their head or anything like that. They came down the strap because that's for their customs and traditions. But they came down to get the Ku Klux Klan out and they got them out. Next slide. This is actually from an article from, I believe, Time Life speaking about this for the Klan Ku Klux. Ku Klux is anti-Indian media. And I'll just read what it says in part. Um, fewer than 100 Klansmen, only one of them hooded, came suddenly 350 Indians, okay. most of them from the fiercely prideful Lumbee tribes. Some of them armed, swung down on the rabbit. After one Indian sharpshooter shot out a light bulb, near the clan's microphone. You know what that means? That means I'm doing a speech right here. And somebody pops this, somebody do that, I'm gone. That's, it's over. It's, there is no more presentation. Thank you, God bless, good night. So needless to say, shout out above near the clan's microphone. The Raiders panicked. Oh, yeah, panicked. The Klansmen and several hundred curiosity seekers with the hand-to-hand -hand scuffle shown here in a noisy but largely in innocuous barrage of shots. Flying buckshot paint one man in the face and another in the ear, but nobody was killed. It seemed that the Klan had taken on just too many things. <laughs> That's what it said. <laughs> they didn't see where they arrested the Klansmen. Um, but they got down. They didn't play no games. So that shows the spirit, the warrior spirit of these people. And the Lumbee people have always fought for their identity. They made it clear who they were and who they were not. While you may agree or may not agree with them, they fought and stood by that claim. And they wasn't gonna let anybody change them around for that. And we're gonna get into a discussion of why that is, is because when you get to the names of all these different, um, these tribes, nations, clans, they're dealing with an identity that ties back to something that we're gonna speak on called nationality. So, next slide. The Choanoak. Showing the lot. This is the actual uh, modern day picture. Uh, you see the sign right there. All of those people there are part of the Children of the Lock people. And as you see on the sign, it says, Principal Village of the Children of the Lock Indians led in 1580s by Minna um, Tanona was three miles east largest Algonquin group in North Carolina at English contact. Now, there's a picture that I don't have in this presentation, but for those who had the opportunity to see my, um, my event posting on Facebook, there's a um, picture that I showed. That picture was a photograph of the Algonquins in the early 1920s. And um, you see, that they were all uh, various hues, but all melanated, from dark to light. And you see here, from dark to light, everyone doesn't have the same hair texture. You have from straight, to curly, wavy, to very woolly. So um, you can't judge a book by its color. And that's what, unfortunately, we do to, in today's society. We're always judging and saying, oh, well, you this, you that. You can't be this, you can't be that. 
when it's important to tie through our bloodline and through our lanes exactly who we are as a people. In regards to who you are, be proud of that. This is a portrait of a Chona, Indian, so-called Indian, in America. Parker D. Robbins. Anyone has heard? Anyone has heard of Parker D. Robbins? This is very important. Parker D. Robbins, as you see in that portrait, you see him in that army uniform. He was a high-ranking official in the Civil War on the side of the Union. He fought on the side of the Union. What makes him so important is not that he just fought in the Civil War, but during the Reconstruction period, how many people heard of Reconstruction? During the Reconstruction period, for those who know, for those who already know, for those who don't know, the Reconstruction period took place um, after this, um, the end of what we know as physical slavery, 18, um, 65, this Reconstruction period opened up the opportunity for free men. And they had a term, Freedmen's Bureau. These freedmen were placed, some of them were placed in office of political power, in political office. Congressman. He was one of the ones that was put as a congressman. He became a congressman as a result of the Reconstruction period. Now, the Reconstruction period is gonna take a, um, be important as I go towards the end of this presentation because you're gonna see a connection with North Carolina history. Now this man here, made part of history amongst our people, people who have been identified as um, Negro, black, colored, etc. And there's another person from North Carolina, who I'll get into later, who took a, um, who played an important part. So, next slide. You massy people. So now we go from North Carolina to South Carolina. We're gonna cross the border. We all one family. You massy people. The you massy people, and that's an actual portrait of the you massy. I'm the massy woman. Again, broad nose. Don't look nothing like Tonto. The Tonto family. See that baby on the back? Now, also, I just want to know, it's just dawned on me, that the way she's holding the baby, um, that's done in a lot of tribes in Africa. The way they have the baby on the back. But what I want to make a point about, oh, we got the massive book. So we can go to the next slide because it, it's all important. This right here is a picture of the Emasi War. Um, I'm going to read the bottom. It says, Dutch painter Peter Schneck painting of the Emasi War. The full title translated from the Dutch reads, The Gruesome Attack of the Indians on the English in Carolina, West Indies, 19 April 1715. This is the actual portrait of what, they, what this painter saw. Look, these are all your masses. Dark skinned people. Not Italians with a tan. It's, and this is, I'm just saying because we have to remove the stereotype that's placed on this. There's actually a town in South Carolina called Yamasa. Just dealing with these people. Now, I'm going to show you in the next slide what was said about the Yamasi people. It says one Yamasi is equal to 10 Indians. Well, I thought you said Yamasi were Indian. Come on, let's read it. The Spaniards found one Yamasi Negro being equal to 10 Indians for work. And they therefore exported these Indian Negroes and carried them to the West Indies to experiment with as slaves. This is from the United States Congressional Records, Congressional Serial Set, United States Government Printing Office, 
57th Congress, first session, House of Representative Document 179, Report of the Industrial Commission on Agri uh, Agricultural and Agricultural Labor, Washington Government Printing Office, year 1901, page 824. Had to give you that so you know that I didn't make it up. And you see that's the image, that's the drawing that they have. That's a your master. That is your master. They still exist to this day. Um, the tribe is still active, though they're not recognized. They still, they still exist, and they're classified um, erroneously as Negro, Black, Colored, etc. They're your masters. Next slide. Now, <clears throat> since we're on South Carolina, I felt the need to. Um, put up this document. This is a page from a, a book called Let's Set the Record Straight. But in it, it has an excerpt of this journals of the House of Representatives dealing with the Sundry Free Moors Act. I've said Moors throughout this. So I'm going to um, read this. It says, the views of slaves and free blacks are rarely found in the petitions. Blacks were often the subjects of petitions submitted by whites. But in one unusual case, four former slaves petitioned in the House, or petitioned the House, for a clarification of their legal status. The ex-slaves Francis, Daniel, Hammond, and Samuel have been subjects of the Emperor of Morocco when they were captured by an African king. I want to pause there and I'll read the rest. I want to make that point because um, another, um, another misconception by people who are familiar with Moors is that the Moors of North Africa, <coughs> Northwest Africa, are solely responsible, or were solely responsible for enslaving the Africans as if we weren't one people. But here, it clearly states in government documents that it says that subjects of the Emperor of Morocco who identified themselves as Moors were captured by an African king. Then it says they were delivered to a Captain Clark on the promise that they would take them, he would take them to England where the Moroccan ambassador would ransom them. But instead, they were sold to South Carolina in South Carolina as slaves. Eventually, the four men purchased their own and their wives' freedom. They now wanted to be assured that if accused of a crime, they would be tried as subjects of a foreign nation by the Court of General Sessions, rather than as free blacks by the magistrates and freeholders' courts. The House decided that the men were citizens of Morocco and thus not subject to the laws of governing free blacks. I want to make this stop here. The reason why the Sundry Free Ma Moors Act is important of 1790 is that South Carolina at that time, prior to that, had a Negro Act. The Negro Act was basically a slave code. It basically was saying what the person that identified as a Negro could not be, or could not do, I should say. And I, I didn't show it in this presentation, but they also have what was called uh, the Negro Laws of 1848. In the Negro Laws of 1848, they gave a definition of the Negro in the first chapter in the third section. And when you read that definition, I'm not going to go into it, but when you read that definition, you'll see why this free, um, Sunday Free Moors Act was important, and it goes down into the introduction. A petition was presented to the House from sundry free moors, subjects of the Emperor of Morocco and residents in this state, praying that in case they should commit any fault amenable to be brought to justice, that they as subjects of a prince in alliance with the United States of America may be tried under the same laws as the citizens of the state would be liable to be tried and not under the Negro Act, which was received and read. 
And this was passed in 1790. So you see, I, and I connected it with Yamasi because the Yamasi was erroneously identified as Negroes. And the reason why that was an issue is because they had a Negro act. And they had a definition according to the state of what a Negro is. They, didn't, they weren't looked at as free people. When the Yamasi were free people. And it says here, the Moors are free people. Next slide. No Drali. We're coming to the close of this presentation. Um, I could not do this presentation without showing this man. Um, I've said this different times about different things. I'm just going to ask, I know some people already know. I'm going to ask, how many people have heard of Nova Jirali? Okay, quite, actually quite a number of people. For those who don't know, Nova Jirali was born in the state of North Carolina in 1886. Some say that he was born in Sampson County. I just showed you a picture of a man, Crow Thompson, in Sampson County. Um, there are some narratives that say he was born on the Cherokee Reservation. Regardless of where he was born, this man is important because he was born in North Carolina. This man is not talked about in any of the public schools. Uh, he, you can barely find him in books. And if you do, it's a very short, short line or two on this man. This man is probably one of the most impactful people of his time next to Marcus Garvey, but he is one of the least talked about. Why do I say that? This man who was born in North Carolina in 1886, he started what was known as the Moorish Divine National Movement. He started it in the year 1913. He moved to Newark, New Jersey, where he originally started it, relocated to Chicago, Illinois. When he moved to Chicago, Illinois to establish <coughs> Um, his movement and built his movement, one of the things he did was first, what made him so important was he told people at that time who was labeled as Negro, Black, Colored, Coon, Shine, Yours and Mine, <laughs> that they were not those titles that delude slavery. He told them that they had a nationality. And he told them what their nationality was. There were others who said, spoke about nationality, but he's the first that I know of in my research who actually distinctly told people who had no nationality or knew no nationality and were being abused because of it what their nationality was. He said, your nationality is Moorish American. Not only did he say that, he acted on it. During the late 1920s, right before he passed away in 1929, the thing that he did, which is really important, which very many people don't know and should know, is that he mobilized the people who were called Moorish Americans. I just want to go to the last slide. You see him posted here, Moorish Americans. And which is kind of explains that is why I have my feathers on. This man mobilized thousands of people to, to get involved in politics behind something that was called a free national ballot, which we call today a voter block. Through this free national ballot, he was successful in getting a man into office by the name of Oscar DePriest in Chicago. How many people have heard of Oscar DePriest? Okay. Oscar DePriest, if you look him up in the history books, they will say he is the first African-American to be um, 
to be elected into Congress, to be put into Congress since the Reconstruction period. Now that goes back to what I was saying about Parker D. Robbins. So after Parker D. Robbins in the, eight, in the 1800s, there wasn't another, another person who looked close to him that was put into Congress until Noble Drew Ali came on the scene, mobilized the Moorish Americans, and got Oscar the Priest in the office. This is three decades before what we know today as the Civil Rights Movement. This is in the 1920s, not the 50s, not the 60s, not the 70s. You have to think about that for a minute. Because we all know about the Civil Rights Movement. A lot of us seen Selma, the movie, and know what a lot of our elders had to go through, get beaten. You know, hoses put on, dogs sick on, a whole bunch of stuff. This man was able to mastermind and strategize a political voting movement based on nationality alone. Something that has not been done since. And he is all but completely wiped out of history. And that's something we have to think about. Um, this is actually the last slide of this presentation. But in saying this, and I will open up, uh, we'll conclude and open this up for questions, is that, again, um, with this history, from knowing our past, you can know where you are and know where you need to go. Uh, this is at least I hope it has been something that uh, people are, were able to get something from as far as the information that's being presented. And, and what I'd like for this to do is spark conversation into terms of identity. Uh, because there's a lot of talk about identity. We all heard about um, racial dozel and all that. Um, who exactly are you? Where do you come from? What, what is your connection? And how does that play in your day-to-day -day affairs? Most importantly, because it's good to just re know history, but if the history is not applicable in real time, then it's just a conversation. So that is the purpose of this presentation. And I, and I do thank you, and I want to, um, at this time, open up for questions. Tremendously enjoyed that presentation, I think. And you mentioned several times about how that's not part of school stuff. And you know, we have started a campaign where we're trying to make black history, African history, Morris history, mandatory for high school graduation in North Carolina, and demand that uh, black history, Morris history, African history are in all middle and high school. Can you speak directly, brother, how knowing your nationality and your history can impact that segment of uh, generation, especially young African-American men. Absolutely, and that, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, this is important. History and nationality is important, particularly with our young people for this particular fact, many facts for this particular fact. Our young people out here, and I'm glad to see that there's some young people here, our young people, those of us who have been classified um, according to race, by race through what is known as Federal Directive 15, as black or African American, in our communities, there is a sense of hopelessness. And the reason why there's a sense of hopelessness is because, in my humble opinion, there's no connection with an identity and an origin to which they can see how to conduct themselves. In all different nationalities, whether it be Chinese, Japanese, 
uh, Italians and stuff, there is a certain, they give you a history, you know, for those who operate on their nationality, they tell you their history early. And then in conjunction with their history, they tell you their values, right? History is supposed to reveal your value system, your morals, your code of conduct, what you stand for, your principles. As the brother um, stated in the, um, in the introduction, five, sim five simple principles that I adhere to. Love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Those are principles that are embedded in my identity. And when you have people, you have young brothers and sisters who don't have that connection, they don't see themselves as having a place in society because they don't have their own society, right? I, I always say this, there's always an argument about the young people like um, their laws. They don't, you know, they have no respect for the law. Well, how can you have respect for something you don't know? How can you have respect for something you wasn't taught? How can you say that I'm not a law-abiding citizen when I wasn't even taught, one, the laws that wish to abide, but more importantly, what makes me a citizen? What makes you a citizen? And that's the thing that we have to deal with as far as, that's why nationality and history is completely important. Yes? When we talk about our children not knowing the law and not going by the law, we have been taught well by a very unlawful set of rules. So why are we going to hold them to what is lawful when some of the most devious things were done, not only by law, but with a Bible in the hand? And then look at them, well, John, you, you don't know how to act. They've been taught very well. If you're taught, if, you, if we teach, because in the end, we're going to have to be the ones that teach our youth. So when we teach them their history, we actually are setting the standards of giving them our laws of our society. Because in law, I, I study law to some degree. I'm not a lawyer, but I study it. Nationality. This is the definition of nationality in law. Nationality is the quality and character that arises from the fact of one belonging to a nation. A nation is a people existing in the form of an organized, general society. So it's not so much that you're a nation, because remember you you just went into a bunch of Native American nations. Cherokee is called a nation. You can be part of the Cherokee Nation here in North Carolina or in Oklahoma, right? A nation within a nation. And they have their own jurisdiction, et cetera. But the point is that they have their, they are organized and they're part of a general society. Your society sets your laws and, and rules and regulations where you say, look, this is what we don't do. We don't. Um, we don't disrespect our elders. That's, that's one law within a society, right? Certain things that we have to instill in our people and that, when you do that, which is why I presented this, we take control. It's, it's called self-determination. In the United Nations, they have the um, Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People. And they also have the United, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Within, within that, it states that every person has a right to a nationality. And every person has a right to change their nationality. Well, if you don't know what nationality is, how do you know what nationality to get? How do you know what nationality to change to? You don't even know what nationality is. You don't know what your nationality is. Again, we have. We have these rights that those who understand international law, not codes and regulations, I'm not, you know, statutes and things like that, but international law which deals with law of the family of nations. In other words, our ancestors, 
if there was different tribes, they had treaties. Treaties and supreme law of the land. There was an understanding that if my family deal with your family, we deal based on this code. Families make nations, right? So, and, it, and, it, and I'm bringing it back down to the, to the fundamental. It goes back down to family. There's been a breakdown in our family. Because if you can break down a family, if you don't know how to govern family, how can you govern a nation, a community? So these are the things that we have to take charge of and uh, be assertive in. And when, that, when we do that, in my humble opinion, we won't, we won't, um, we won't be as affected by these things that are taking place now as we, as we are now. That's my humble opinion. Yes, brother. Yeah, the, um, I have a question, quick question with the Yamasee Eagle and the Ten Indians. Yes. The slide that you went over. Yes. You, uh, I think, it was a congressional article that was stating that was giving information about the meeting of Native people. Yes. What was the name of that document, that article that you were referencing as you were reading? I didn't catch it. Okay. Is, is it possible? Because I don't have it on top of my head. Can you go back to that um, that slide? Or did, yeah, right yeah, that one. Yeah. Go back. That one right there. Okay. It's um, United States congressional records, congressional serial set. United States Government Printing Office, 57th Congress, first session, House of Representatives, document 179, report of the Industrial Commission on Agricultural and Agricultural Labor, Washington Government Printing Office, year 1901, page 824. I know that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it possible that you could provide that JPEG? For somebody to just send it to the email. Well, it's uh, a JPEG, is it not? You said it's a JPEG. This is yeah. a PowerPoint. Oh, that that particular image, the JPEG. Yeah, I think I can send that particular JPEG. Yeah, I think that would simplify. Yeah, yeah. I would be there, like yeah. just to read it. So, um, what if for those who wish to, um, you can leave me your email address, and uh, I can send you that JPEG. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your talk. Um, Thank you. I have some observations and then a question. <coughs> I was raised on the South Side of Chicago on a uh, product of Chicago Public Schools. And I want to say that um, I went to a school that's probably about 90% African American. And there was a heavy emphasis on African American history uh, by all the teachers. And it was it was pushed by several organizations that we had in Chicago on the South Side, the Black Panther Party, the Operation Push, Jesse Jackson and Operation Push, and the Blackstone Rangers organization, which were all activists in the South Side community. And myself as a minority in a majority, it's really helped me to understand the whole complex of our government, our social service system, and that was a time when my classmates could, could achieve whatever they wanted because their experiences and their history was valuable. Right. And now it seems like it's reversed and it's going backwards. Um, so we need somehow um, this gentleman here that talked about your uh, um, project to get black history in the schools. It's very, very important. Um, that everybody, like you said, everybody knows where they come from. Um, I was privileged to have that. Most people with my skin color, you know, don't have, don't, don't, never learn that stuff. So we got to cut, sometimes we have to cut them a little break for not understanding that, but they need to learn it. Yeah. Not just African Americans learning their own history, but the rest of us learn <coughs> it so we can understand things like white privilege and stuff like that. But my point is that it just seems like it's all going backwards. Mm -hmm. And my daughter, who is um, Latino American, went to Durham School of Arts. And she had an awesome <coughs> history experience there in American history because the teacher taught from alternative textbooks like Howard Zinn mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So it is there if 
if someone works toward it, but I think it does need to be something that's mandated or something that's understood by everybody. My second question is, I mean, my question is, um, considering that the Moorish aspect of this were originally Muslim, I assume? Um, Muslim uh, Many of them were, many of them. Did you find any kind of um, tradition <coughs> or any kind of anything from the Muslim religion that's still part of these people's lives, or it has been totally obliterated? Well, that's a good question. Um, that just struck me. I mean, they kept so much of their racial or their national identity, but what about their religious identity? That, that's, that's a very good question, because in my research, and um, again, I, I can only speak on my research, not to say that it doesn't exist, other things don't exist, but certain aspects, elements of language, I saw was was continued mm -hmm. um, Arabic. Um, also, there is a, a lot of the the Muslim religion had been lost um, as it was with other um, groups that came here. Um, from Senegal, Gambia, etc., who who were professed Muslims and then um, were converted into Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of the things did keep in. There are certain Native Americans who do still wear turban, mm -hmm. um, Cherokees, um, certain cultural things mm -hmm. that still continues. But you're right; a lot of it was lost. And I did, I, it's very interesting because I remember learning in middle school, like in eighth grade, we learned about the Black Moor. We call them the Black Moors in Chicago. Yeah. Right. And they had the, they wore the same fez that you wear. Yes. And it was, uh, I guess it all flowed from the gentleman you talked about. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I, did, I didn't connect it all, so that was really awesome to, Thank to hear that. <laughs> and uh, I'm shocked that a lot of, not enough people know about Noble Juwali. I didn't know, he said out of his mouth, I didn't know he was born in North Carolina. He was, he was familiar with the Moors because the Moors was in the prison, but he didn't know that fact. Mm -hmm. And he came to me and said that. Mm -hmm. So these little things, when we start to learn about each other, it, it breaks barriers. And that's, just that's just thinking about Donald Trump and all this anti-Muslim stuff, well, apparently the Muslims have been with us since. Exactly. <laughs> since. Exactly. We've been here. And they're still here, but exactly. they might not look like what he's. What he right. Right. Without hearing his name, I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. I know some other people raised their hand. I'm not bothering you. Yes, ma'am. Bring the point forward that the gentleman made, and actually this gentleman just made um, about putting the, the uh, history, my history, into the school system. I, I wanted to say how important it was for several reasons. Number one, I we just um, do our equal people class, which is another study group, uh, study by Carter G. Woodson just this past week, and uh, in part of in part of what he was saying was that um, uh, black history needed to be taught and understood and elevated within the school system, not only because of uh, the training and the advantage and the inspiration that it gives to our own young people, but it also elevates our people within the broader community. And that's what is, is just as important. But I wanted to add another thing. I know a lot of you have heard of the fact that you know, a lot of the uh, textbooks from the educational system come out of Texas. <laughs> and uh, recently, they have been decided to change the uh, presentation of certain things about uh, African-American people in terms of human slavery to present it just as if it were kind of an acceptable type uh, thing. My point is this, that when you do put it in the school system, you have to make sure that, that um, intellectual African-Americans control that information so that you know exactly what is being taught so that they are not presented with this garbage that comes out of Texas. So I'm hoping that everybody in this room is 
is uh, okay. will be ready to support you in whatever that particular um, uh, that proposal comes through this community. And I was wondering if you could talk more about how we could um, uh, recognize it. In other words, what are you, how what is the method that is going to be used so that we'll be ready to support you? Yeah. I, I, was that a question for Ms. Paul oh, Stafford? Sorry. This gentleman. Yeah, so you. Yes, she asked you. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, briefly, uh, right now we're at the stage we're just putting on the table. And like you were saying, Brother Shem, that leads to the walk to the broader discussion. But now that it's on the table, we can tie everything in. First, it had to be presented on the table. First it's on the table, then we go to, first we deal with whether, first we know it's not in all the high schools, we know it's not, there's no middle school curriculum. Um, so first we get that straight, that we, in this room, have to let the, the people in Raleigh, the people in the local communities know we want it. Then we deal with, okay, now that you know we want it, what's the quality of how you want to teach? Thank you, Oh, um, I'll answer just real quick. I want to um, give thanks to uh, Brother Carter Q. He just, while y'all you know, was discussing, showed me this book, um, Slave Songs of the Georgia Sea Islands, um, to your question about the continuation of the Muslim um, tradition. In the beginning, this is actually, a, uh, this shows an image of an Arabic manuscript that was kept. So certain um, things actually still continued on even during that time. So I just wanted to make that point. So, I also want to know if you can expand on what the difference is between uh, the spellings like M-O-R and, and then M-U, because I've seen like Mitch, uh, Wichita Morris, it's M-U-U-R. I'm glad you mentioned this. Um, I got the um, Return of the Ancient Ones. This book right here is a book that deals with the Washita. Now, the Washita um, actually come out of um, Louisiana. And they actually use the term more as M-U-U-R. Um, that originates from them. Um, and of course, it gives a history about you know where that term comes from with the M-U. Um, going back all the way to the land of, of Mew and things of that nature. So that's according to this record. Now, one thing that's interesting about the word more is that a common thing that's said is that more comes from the Greek, uh, Greek word um, moros, uh, meaning black and scourge or whatever. Well, there's actually records of, of more prior to the Greek, but it's in different different spellings. Uh, you had the Mori, M A U R. You had the uh, Maori, M A O R I. And Maori comes has roots in Hebrew. There's a term called Mao. My or means illumination, mm. or luminary, or one of light, because the word or in Hebrew means light, and the suffix or the prefix of of the m, the mean, Hebrew mean, maor, maori, one of light. So it goes back before the Greek, you know. But um, that's cool, based on my research. So I hope that. Yes. Um, that book that you previously were showing us slave songs. Who's the author of that book? Good question. Lydia Parrish. Is Lydia Parrish? How do you spell that? L Y D I A Parrish. P A R R I S H. Yes, brother. I just want to make a quick comment. I, mean, I appreciate the presentation. Thank you. And I, see, I know the value of the information that you presented. 
one thing I just want to notate is the um, the book Encyclopedia of America, the uh, with the with the Native American, they, different Native uh, peoples and different uh, hues of them. Uh, I do know there are two copies of that book that's still in existence. One is in a law library somewhere in uh, I forgot which college, but Ithaca, New York. Mm -hmm. And there's another copy that's online. Um, for a rare book site, and it was last I checked, it was valued at sixty thousand wow. dollars. So that right there, I know if you yes. the importance of a book being sixty thousand dollars. Exactly. From, uh, the exactly. Encyclopedia of First Peoples of uh, First Accounts of America. Right. So yeah, so that book is online. I don't know the condition, but um, <laughs> I think it's Bauman. I think it's, Bauman. I think it's a website called Bauman Books where they do all the rare books, first editions of books okay. throughout the. Americas that was printed, but yeah, it's, they got a copy for sixty thousand dollars. Thank you, brother. And um, that's an important note because somebody got hold a book for sixty thousand dollars. I ain't. Well, that's kind of inflated, but not, so. <laughs> they gotta have some cheese. So obviously, that's something that's not um, considered to be easily accessible, and is not made easily accessible for a reason. I'm not going to speculate on the reason why, but we know it's a reason. But thank you for that. Yes? To elaborate on the young teens, because of my experience, but under the title that we've been given as far as blacks and African Americans and all that stuff, there's, from what I'm understanding, two different laws when it comes to dealing with the law of this land. Will you elaborate on that, or is that too deep? I mean, I can, I can go into it. When it comes to the young people not respecting the law and not knowing the law, you, you, it says something in the law where is, you know, even under ignorance, you're not. Yes. So, yeah. in, in, in not knowing there's two different sets of laws by not having a nationality versus having a, being under nationality, and why even in knowing the law, if you're not under nationality, why you fall in the category that we have failed in since we've been here. Okay. Well, let me let me, and I, I know where you, and I understand. Because I want just question. to kind of feed something to her about what's kind yeah, of. Yeah, I want to um, to elaborate. In law, nationality determines political status. Uh, you heard me state earlier about citizen. What makes a citizen? I ask the question. Now, by default. Um, and even listed within the 14th, Amer uh, 14th Amendment of the Constitution that states that those who are born here uh, are considered, uh, considered citizens. Now, <coughs> that is true. Are you a, do you have full citizenship rights? Mm -hmm. Is the question, right? What do I mean by that? Okay. People who go to prison they say when they come out, they can't vote. And that's a right of, of a citizen, right? Now, if they filled out their um, employee application and say, are you a US citizen, they would check yes. But yet, as that citizen, they can't vote, right? So, bringing it back to nationality. Nationality determines political status, right? So, what does that mean? Political status doesn't mean that if you don't have a nationality, you can't participate in the political process because there are people who don't know their nationality who are voting, getting into office, things of that nature. But what political status means in terms of that means that you have a basis of political power. Your political status, status means standing means that in law, you are able to operate from a standpoint of political power. What do I mean by that? I'll give you one example, reparations. If you look at the history of where reparations was given to, it was given to people who had a nationality. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Japanese Americans, Jewish Americans, et cetera. They, they exercise nationality. So that is where the difference really comes from. Nationality determines political status. Yes? I have another question too, not trying to like backtrack, but um, it just hit me. When we were talking about teaching, especially the young people, about their history and where they came from. 
But my question is, I have seen some myself that were even afraid to learn their history because they were ashamed of, of their skin because we know with the media and the society that we live in today, we are made to think that lighter is prettier, lighter is better. So how can we get the young people past the point of where they're afraid to learn where they came from because of the color of their skin so they can understand where they're going and know their past and their ancestors? How can we get them past that mindset? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. That is going to take a concentrated effort, in my humble opinion, to get them to see their skin color as beautiful. Right. Now, the challenge in that is that they are bombarded by media images that portray the opposite. So it's almost as if you have to um, detox them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. You have to heal that scar that's been inside them, you know, because rather if they went through something in their family or they were picked on in school or whatever may have you, I noticed, because even I'm a victim of that, I was a victim of that, that that scar of, okay, well, if I'm darker, I'm not as pretty as someone that's lighter. Right. So, and for a while, that hindered me from wanting to learn my history until the point now where I became over that and came past that fear, but I noticed that a lot of younger people are suffering with that as well, even a lot of young people have came to me and talked to me about that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a deep scar that really has to be healed in the younger community, mm -hmm. I know for sure. Absolutely. In order for them to accept their past and where they came from. Absolutely. That's true. I'm going to answer. I know that brother had a question. No, I just want to make a, a reference, reference to her question. I feel like exactly what you said is a detoxing. A lot of the uh, media on the internet and the TV that our youth are subjected to, when they do see our, uh, our people, a lot of times we pray that it's a positive image, but there's so many negative uh, images that are on the TV and on the media about us. And then because, like you said, a lot of our youth don't have an identity or don't really know their cultural roots, Right. They, the media is telling them who they should be or what they are. Right. And when it's, in fact, it's just a form of entertainment or maybe expression or ideology or, dare we say, um, programming from a, right. a not so benevolent nature. <laughs> but we, but I, I think it's basically getting the youth to detach away from the mainstream media that they're so easily subjected to and maybe come to organize uh, meetings in our community like this one, as well as being exposed to different texts that they're not exposed to in school. And I think that's gonna start with some of us within our own family. Absolutely. Like with our younger cousins, brothers, yeah. who have the information, we gotta start exposing them to other things that they're not Indeed. usually exposed to. That's, that's the key right there. Yes, yeah. sister. We're gonna have to bring our children together before mm -hmm. middle school and high school. Yeah. Right. The damage is already done, and it's not just a scar, it's a festering sore that's going to have to be surgically dug out because it's going back seven, eight, nine generations of what's been passed forward. And I look at little children, because I look at myself when I'm in a mixed group, and it always comes up to holidays and culture and things in your family and people all the, well this is a, a, an Italian from, from my great grandmother. This is a recipe she passed down. This is something we do. This is something we do. And they get to me and I'm not a child. And so what, is, what, what did your great grandparents do? What were their holidays and I'm thinking we just do what y'all told us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what the children do the same thing when they get in groups and they're doing the Chinese New Year and all of this. Our kids have nothing that they can add except what's been put into them. Exactly. So it's going to have to start before oh, that school. I, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yes, brother. I think so.
want to get some people who did, did raise their hands. The elder, yes, sir. Uh, I have a suggestion. Yes, sir. I, 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 I really uh, have enjoyed your program. Thank you, sir. And I wish you God's name uh, with it, that you develop it and carry it on and we can get it repeated and repeated and repeated in many other places. Yes, sir. Inshallah. I've been attending some of the programs here at this library, and this is a suggestion to all the brothers from the various groups I know are here now. Uh, Kyle Q, who's sitting up at the computer, uh, who's responsible for most of us delivering our programs here, has had a very interesting series called the Poster Series. Those you may see that advertise. It's been a series of poster making. That's Mina. That's Mina. Yes, Impacts what you were talking about. Image. These are images. These are posters. This has to do with the media we're talking about. And the importance of what are called icons. The icon is really a supreme kind of, uh, could be a monster. It could be a benevolent type creature. But the media as monster, media as poster, media being taught here in the same room. Yeah. There's going to be a, kind of correct me if I'm wrong, another, there's an end to the series? Yeah, that's uh, February, the, February the 25th. I encourage everybody in here, even though it may sound unrelated, is to come and acquaint yourself with a very vibrant aspect of the media in which Durham will soon be home to its own press, its own um, print lithographic service here. Right. And it would be very interesting if some young people of all shades and all denominations and of all aspects of the Moorish experience or of the African American experience to come and input into the poster making so they can see images of themselves in the Durham area. You can push that button, I'm almost certain. A new projection. A new projection. A new projection with a new, uh, the birth of a new media center right here in Houston. I mean, right here in Durham. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I can travel But I encourage, I really encourage everyone here, and I, I'm, I'm familiar with a lot of the folks here, that we can create our own icons. Yes. See, as individuals, we don't have the power. We don't have the, the falutes, we don't have the money, we don't have the, we don't have the influence. But there are schools of thought, there are schools that are being born in Durham now. One of them is this photographic studio, this print studio that's aligned with this very room we're sitting in, that we can begin to place posters. Even they were talking about creative graffiti. The word graffiti usually has a bad uh, <laughs> connotation, mm -hmm. but we can place Yasmin's face mm -hmm. and faces like Yasmin and other sisters in here all throughout the Durham, all throughout North Carolina. I mean, there could be they could be responsible for it, and they can learn it. We can provide scholarships. We can provide the monies in which they can learn this art form, take it to their masjids, to their temples, to their churches, and begin to reproduce and produce themselves in a, in a, in a positive way. So that's just a suggestion. Absolutely. Good thanks for I suggest, oh, and added to that, Everybody needs to be on the mailing list from this library so that you can receive the information when these poster classes are being given you. That way you can come and take over and show yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with your jab, without your jab, however you want to be. This. Any questions? OK. Yes? With regards also to um, some of the division that you might have, like within indigenous communities, maybe could you say something about like 
for example, we have like the uh, Saponi people. The Saponi, yes. You know, you have the Halawa Saponi, you have the Okanichi Saponi in North Carolina. You've got uh, indigenous peoples that are kind of split you know, within the same family. Right. And I was wondering if you could speak on that. Like one side of the family says we this, but it's the same family. The other side right. is saying we right. that. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of, um, I wanted to, I alluded to it, but I didn't go into it when I went into the, um, the Croatan. Um, and the whole aspect of that letter that was written by James Moon, um, where he was basically saying that when you deal with the Croatan, Redbone, Melungeons, um, Moors, Portuguese, you're dealing with local names of, of one people. It's, it's the equivalent, honestly, of, I'll put it like this. Let's say you got someone here from Durham. I represent Bull City, right? They, that's an identity that they have. You know, you go to Charlotte, that's not what they say, right? In Wilmington, they'll say Port City. You follow? But it's still the same people, right? You know, some people have, have broken it down into gangs. See what I'm saying? I'm blood, I'm crip, you know, I'm this. But you, you have the same bloodline. You divided yourself arbitrarily by association with a group and a title and a name and identity, and then you start dressing a certain way and calling yourself this, you know. But, but bloodline, Bloodline wise, you're the same. You're connected. So uh, the same thing happened with the Native Americans. Uh, different names were attached to them based on their, their locale. And then they acquired different uh, traditions unique to where they were at. But there were still some similarities. And then thus, you have what you have today. Yes, brother. I know you mentioned uh, uh, New Orleans, yes. um, but I know a lot of people don't, um, I guess, you know, the correlation between him and Mark Darwin. Oh, absolutely. And absolutely, and that's a great question. Um, in the more science temple, we identify Marcus Garvey as the harbinger or the forerunner of Nova Drali. Mm -hmm. And here's the connection. Marcus Garvey, who was born in Jamaica, came to the United States, established the UNIA, and he taught people about race pride. He taught them about race pride. He said, um, race first. He spoke about the fact that we as a people could do whatever we wanted to do. He said, one of the things he said was, the greatest weapon against the Negro is this organization. <coughs> the largest organization of its kind, over six million members worldwide. And he played a very instru um, instrumental part in getting our people to have that sense of pride, we talked about that, with the identity, and getting them to think in terms of peoplehood and nationhood. He spoke of nationhood. He spoke about nationality. He said that we want a nationality like that of the French, the German, the English. He said that. Noble Drew Ali said, you have a nationality. Your nationality is most American. He said, come on, ye Asiatics of America, and learn the truth. Hear the truth about your nationality and your birthrights. Also, during the time when the government, through what was called the Bureau of Investigation that later became known as the FBI, through J. Edgar Hubert, infiltrated the UNIA <coughs> and arrested Marcus Garvey, before they deported him back to Jamaica, he was held in the federal penitentiary in Atlanta, 
Well, during that time, and we in the Morris Science Temple of America have record of it, we have proof. Noble Dr. Ali visited. He actually left, took a trip from Chicago to Atlanta. We have the image of the post call that Noble Dr. Ali sent to his wife from the penitentiary in Atlanta. He said, I just met Marcus, Mr. Garvey. I shall be back soon, I'm paraphrasing. And it was published in the Moorish American newspaper known as the Moorish Guide, that he took the trip and visited Marcus Garvey. There are those who don't know about that who would say that, oh, well, they never dealt with each other, et cetera, et cetera. But we have actual empirical evidence showing that there was a correspondence. Now, anyone knows about anything dealing with the prison, whether you visit it or you've been in it, know that anybody can't just visit you. I can't just go up and walk in and say, yo, I want to speak to, um, I want to speak to uh, Abu Mumia. I read his book. I just want to speak to him. No. No, you're not on the list. <laughs> we don't know you. Go home. But Nobody Ali was able to meet Marcus Garvey. So that's, that is, um, how deep the connection is, you know, we, we can speculate, but we do have the evidence that they did they did communicate with each other. Yes. Yes. Real quick, brother. Are you available for lectures? And if someone wanted to get in contact with you in regards to books or lectures, what's your contact information? Yes, and I thank you for that. I am available for um, lectures. Um, and I do, of course, I don't have my books with me here, but I also have um, books that I wrote. For those who wish to contact me, uh, you can contact me via email. That's probably the best way. My email address is, I'll spell it, S-H-E-M 45 at hotmail.com. And you can just put in the title, um, reference to, uh, you can say, we'll make it easy. Um, library presentation, library lecture, whatever it is, and I'll know that that's what it's in reference to, and uh, I'll definitely respond as soon as possible. Yes, bro. If you're interested in getting the slides, could you, I guess, could you get them, I guess, Well, what I'm doing, see, that's the purpose of um, the brother who's filming it, because we're going to actually have the film. Okay. Now, I, I did say I would allow for one JPEG, I, you know, this being that this is my intellectual property, but I, we will produce a video that will be available to the public. Yes, if um, there were no other questions, I, yes, ma'am. How, how did we get on the mailing list to get the information for the library presentation? Okay, um, we do have. Um, I can just take your contact information, but we most of the programs that we have via the Durham County Library system is on the uh, Durham County Library website. Okay. Yeah, most of most of everything, that, and we also have a program guide that comes out quarterly. There's some that are upstairs, and it's called the Humanities Guide, and it's for adult programs throughout Durham County Library system. But uh, if uh, you just need to contact me, you can do that. The number here is 560-0270. Uh, and you can just ask for me. Uh, and that's Carter Q, C-U-E. And I'll be glad to send anything out to you that you might need. All right. Once again, I, I thank everybody. Before I conclude, um, I want to say normally, um, and uh, in our temple, we do presentations when we conclude our, our demonstration. We conclude um, in a Moorish American prayer. Um, I know that there's different people of different um, religious, um, different religions, so out of respect, I will just say the Moorish American prayer, and then I'll do a general prayer, you know, for everybody wishing you well. Our Moorish American prayer is as follows. Allah, the Father of the universe, Father of love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. 
The Lord is my protector, my guide, and my salvation by night and by day. Through his holy prophet, Drew Ali. Amen. With that, um, it is my hope um, that each and every one of you was able to get something out of it. And I do pray that the Most High, by whatever name you call the Most High, um, guides you and um, protects you um, on your journey. With that, I thank you all.